Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopez, as always, and today I'm joined by Dr. Stefan Blanke. He is Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. He studies the diffusion of scientific and pseudoscientific beliefs from an epidemi epidemiological perspective. His research focuses on the psychological and environmental factors that shape and constrain the development and distribution of these beliefs in the history and philosophy of science, science education, and the public understanding of science. He is also interested in the philosophy of cultural evolution and the role of reasons in cultural phenomena such as science, morality, and the self. And those are some of the topics that we're going to talk about today. So, Dr. Blanca, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me as well, Ricardo. Thank you for the invitation uh, to, uh, to appear in your program and to do, uh, to do the interview. I'm looking forward to it. So, uh... Okay, great. Likewise. So, let's start with this question. I mean, I think I haven't talked that much about the demarcation problem on the show. I remember talking about, we, about it with Dr. Massimo Pigliucci, for example, but I mean, I can't recall any other conversation where I really mentioned that. So what is the demarcation problem? Well, the demarcation problem is the uh, problem of demarcating or making the distinction uh, between science and non-science or pseudoscience. Uh, so it's a problem in, within philosophy of uh, science. And I think it's a very interesting uh, problem, uh, especially when you're talking about demarcation between science and pseudoscience. I, th I think that is the most relevant. Why? Because you are there confronted with irrational beliefs uh, that pretend to be trustworthy. Um, and I think that can pose an important problem, or they, they indeed pose an important problem uh, for society as well. So it's not just a philosophical question, I think, but it also has important societal implications, um, and which is also the reason why philosophers took up with this project of demarcating science from pseudoscience. Uh, from the very start, they were the logical positivists in the 1910s, 1920s. Uh, uh, they were confronted with all sorts of ideologies, uh, the, the rise of, of uh, fascism, of uh, Nazism, communism, um, and so what they wanted to do was to, to develop a scientific worldview uh, and they wanted to establish what, what was so special about science because they were really impressed by science, especially uh, the relativity theory by, by Einstein. And so they wanted to account for that difference. So why, what is it that we on the one hand have this wonderful science that allows us to make wonderful predictions and to, to develop technology and, and, and things? Um, and then on the other hand, we have all this these weird beliefs, these ideologies that seem to uh, have enormous consequences uh, for society. So they wanted to return to a rational uh, worldview. And so other philosophers have picked up on this, um, on this project, you could say. For instance, the famous philosopher Karl Popper uh, also engaged very much in the distinction between uh, science and pseudoscience. Um, and then uh, people like the Hungarian philosopher Imre Lakatos, so they were all very concerned with the, the, the societal implications of pseudosciences or of, of weird beliefs that inspired behavior that had enormous tragic consequences. For instance, as you know, Nazism and communism, they, they resulted in millions of, of, of deaths. So I think this is a very urgent and legitimate um, concern. So that is the, the demarcation question, the demarcation problem. Now, I must say that the problem had disappeared for a while uh, from the philosophical focus. One of the reasons was that there was a, a very influential paper by Larry Lorden, uh, the philosopher Larry Lorden, who announced the means of the, the demarcation project. Uh, and this explains why, like, partly at least, uh, why philosophers had not taken up this project or this problem anymore. But recently, but of course, I should say, deny, well, saying that, that the project is a no-go, of course, does not take away the fact that you can still make the distinction between science and pseudoscience. And you know, for instance, that evolutionary biology is a science and that creationism, uh, the belief that God created all life on Earth and, and humans, 
six thousand years ago or ten thousand years ago. And this, the one is a sinus, the other one is a pseudoscience. So what explains the difference? Right? So the problem does not go does not go away. Um, and you see that recently the, the the project has been taken up again. Um, one of the reasons is uh, a volume that was edited by Massimo Pigliucci together with my former uh, colleague and my friend, uh, uh, so Martin Boudry eh, at Kent University. So they compiled a, a volume called The uh, Philosophy of, uh, of Pseudoscience, uh, to which I was also uh, happy to contribute. And since then you see like uh, this um, change, I think, in, uh, in, in philosophy of science, where there is a new, renewed interest in, in the demarcation uh, project so it's it's back alive it's been brought back to life you could uh, you could say yeah yeah uh, have we already solved in any way the demarcation problem because i mean i think that people are still discussing how we should really demarcate science from pseudoscience and i mean perhaps the sort of criteria that we should use to do so right yeah well, that's indeed a very good observation. Huh? So uh, there's one thing about making the demarcation in an intuitive way. Uh, so that's quite easy. And there is quite a bit of consensus about what counts as a science or what counts as a pseudoscience. Uh, for instance, we, we, most philosophers and scientists would agree that uh, creationism, for instance, is a pseudoscience, but also astrology. Uh, so there are very clear cases about which most philosophers and scientists agree, look, this is a pseudoscience. And of course, we all agree about what counts as a science. And of course, there are a couple of gray zones in, in between, huh? but there are uh, quite a few clear cases as well. Now, this is what something that uh, the, the, the Swedish philosopher Sven Ove Hansen has observed, namely that uh, there, there seems to be this agreement, intuitive agreement about what counts as science and what counts as uh, pseudoscience. But the problem is, the challenge, of course, the philosophical challenge, is to account for why we have this uh, intuition. Uh, so what you see within the demarcation project is that this intuition that we have about what counts as science and what counts as pseudoscience is taken for granted, so to speak. And then we have to account for why we have this intuition. Um, and here we seem that uh, it's not so easy to really pinpoint uh, the, what exactly explains the difference. Uh, uh, and we see that, indeed, as you mentioned, that there has been quite a, uh, a big debate, philosophical debate about this, and it still has not come to rest. Uh, so there's, in philosophy, of course, you, you, it's, philosophy is often uh, rather a question of, uh, a question of asking questions uh, uh, rather than providing secure, well-secured and, 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 and uh, well, well-secured answers. And we see in the history of science that several proposals have been put forward, eh? uh, like the logical positivist thought it was verification, uh, Popper thought it was falsification, um, Lakatos thought that, it, thought that it had something to do with research programs, so you had progressive research programs, which were science, you had, uh, degenerate uh, research programs, which were, which were pseudoscience, or which could lead to uh, pseudoscience. And so you had all these different solutions um, where Philosophers tried to make the distinction by proposing one type of criterion, so like a, like a scalpel that you can use to, to neatly uh, cut off science from, from pseudoscience. But there, was, there were quite a few problems with each of these proposals. I will not go into the details, uh, but there have been some, some problems with these proposals. So the idea that we can make the distinction based on a single criterion uh, um, seems to, does not seem to work. Uh. Uh, so there have been other proposals, for instance, there have been philosophers who have said, well, perhaps instead of using uh, one criterion, uh, we can use several. Uh, so we have a, a multi-criterial uh, approach. Uh, other philosophers have said, maybe we should stop thinking about uh, the distinction in terms of criteria, uh, but maybe we should take more uh, a Wittgensteinian um, approach in the sense of family resemblance. And so we start from the observation of typical pseudosciences and typical sciences, and we see what typical characteristics that they have. And so when we are confronted with a theory, the more typical characteristics it has of science, the more scientific it is. And, and in the other way around, it's the same. Eh? The more characteristics of, of, a, of a pseudoscience it has, the more likely we will call it a pseudoscience, eh? or it will be a pseudoscience. 
And of course, this approach has then the, the advantage uh, that you can uh, more easily um, account for the gray zone in between, uh, because not, not all sciences are clearly science, and not all pseudosciences are clearly pseudoscience. So there is, there is this gray zone. And for instance, a family resemblance approach um, can handle this perhaps better than the other approaches. But again, there is no agreement about whether uh, this family resemblance approach is, is the good approach. Eh? So there are still philosophers who argue, no, perhaps we should look for a more um, normative criterion rather than just merely describing them in terms of, of, uh, of family resemblance. Mm -hmm. um, myself, if I, if I, if I may, um, my view is, is more pragmatic. Eh? So I, I agree with other philosophers that the question of what is a pseudoscience and what is a pseudo, uh, what is science and what is a pseudoscience is largely determined by the scientists themselves. So a scientist, uh, they critically evaluate one another's proposals, and, so they, and also when they when they um, make proposals themselves, they want, when they when they have a particular hypothesis, they will bring in reasons uh, for why the hypothesis is acceptable. And now. I think that scientists evaluate, they propose their own hypothesis and they evaluate the hypothesis of others uh, depending on their evaluation of the reasons that are being provided in that process. And so by, by going through this process of exchanging reasons, and they settle upon the beliefs and the practices that they deem to be justified by proper reasons. Uh, and now, of course, this brings me to pseudoscience. I think that pseudoscience are the, the kind of beliefs that fall out of the scientific conversation, you could so to speak. These are the beliefs that are no longer defended or not, have never been defended by reasons that scientists find um, acceptable. And so it's, it, it's not a normative project, uh, it's a it's more descriptive project. So you have this conversation of scientists and uh, the discussion between scientists that settle what kind of beliefs are acceptable. Uh, um, by looking at what are the reasons and what are good reasons. And then the, the pseudo-scientific beliefs and practices are those beliefs and practices that fall out of this scientific conversation. So about which scientists agree that they are not supported by uh, good reasons. And of which, of course, the proponents still maintain that their beliefs are indeed still up for a discussion within the scientific discussion or that they have been um, wrongly excluded, so that uh, there are no good reasons why they should be excluded. So, for instance, what you often get within pseudoscience is that um, scientists are dogmatists who do not want to open up their mind uh, to integrate uh, to, or to think about this, their proposal, their pseudoscientific uh, proposal. So this is more or less the way that I think about the, the demarcation uh, now, which I'm now uh, developing. Mm -hmm. uh, you've already touched a bit on this question, but uh, I think that one of the questions that people bring to the table when they're dealing with this uh, issue of the demarcation problem is, I mean, what characterizes the scientific method? Because, I mean, science says it's done, in different, it's done differently in different disciplines. So, for example, if we compare physics with the social sciences, we, we get a, a very clear distinction uh, in terms of how science is done in one area versus the other. So, would there be any set of criteria that characterize the scientific method? Is there only one scientific met method or several? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, um, that there are several ways of doing inquiry. Uh, so, there is no such a thing as a scientific method. Um, that would be, it would be, I, I think it would be weird if we would only have one method. One of the reasons is, of course, or may, the main reason is that the world is very complex uh, and it would be very strange if we could handle that complexity by means of a single method. Uh, that was one of the arguments, for instance, that Paul Feyerabend, uh, one of the most uh, famous philosophers, uh, has made about this project of finding this single scientific method that explains at the same time, why science would be rational. Huh? 
So I think that uh, from the sociology of knowledge, eh, the sociology of science, so where people start investigating how exactly scientific communities generate knowledge, and that they have very firmly established that, uh, well, that different communities, different fields, eh, so sci groups of scientists that look into particular uh, problems, that they rely on different methods. Eh? If you want to investigate uh, I, I, the, the smallest particles in the universe, you build a large Hadron Collider in order to make the necessary observations. But that's not necessary when, when you want to understand the behavior of zebras, for instance. Eh? So you, it's, it's a, it's a sem very simple example, but it makes clear that depending on your research question, you will have to uh, come up with different approaches, of course. Um, and that, of course, is the best way to approach a particular topic is in itself the outcome of a scientific inquiry. Huh? So it's not just uh, the focus on the subject of interest or the problem that has to be solved, but also the, the ways of solving the problem is also up for grabs for scientific discussion. Huh? So I like this notion of uh, the philosopher Helen Longino. I'm not sure to what extent you are familiar with her, but she makes this very interesting. She uses this very interesting concept of uh, local epistemology, so that scientists that look at a particular problem uh, that they themselves, by exchanging reasons, uh, determine locally, as uh, your local epistemology within the commu community, what counts as knowledge and what counts as the proper ways of achieving or, or of, of acquiring knowledge. Uh, so I think we, we will see. Yeah, is what we will see then is that there is enormous diversity in the way that scientists try to tackle the problems that they that they're interested in yeah, to find things out. Um, but nevertheless, I also think that of course they are all forms of inquiry, um, and this is something that we find with uh, in uh, the ideas of Susan Hart, uh, who says that science is no different from other forms of inquiry. Say, for instance, a detective who arrives at the crime scene. Um, and who has to find the perpetrator of the crime. Well, basically, scientific inquiry is not that different. As he said, it's only more so, because we use more tools and more things to help us uh, with. Um, but he says, because it's a form of inquiry, there are certain um, aspects that need to be in place, certain elements that have to be in place. For instance, um, that you uh, make informed guesses. So when you are confronted as a scientist with a particular phenomena, you try to come up with a possible explanation for what you observe. Yeah? So this is an informed guess that requires your imagination. But the same thing happens uh, when you watch a detective series, yeah? when you see the detective arriving at the scene, he or she also has to come up with possible explanations for what happens here based on what is observed. Yeah? So you see there are, in, there are no intrinsic differences between scientific inquiry and other forms of inquiry, and so they will share some uh, characteristics across the board. Another one is, for instance, um, intellectual is, is honesty. Eh? So, for instance, a, a police officer is not allowed to put eh, uh, so-called evidence in the crime scene to that directs in the in, in well that that points at a particular person as a perpetrator. The same thing is with science, of course, that you cannot uh, commit fraud and you cannot uh, manipulate your data. Unfortunately, it happens. Eh? Uh, when you read uh, Richie's book, Science Fiction, it's full of examples of how uh, scientists uh, are not always intellectually honest. Uh, but nevertheless, you see that there are some commonalities between these different forms of inquiry also within science, despite, of course, the fact that you will have different uh, methodologies or methods. <laughs> So, in terms of the demarcation problem, isn't it also a problem that um, pseudo-scientists usually try to mimic science? I mean, they try to dress their pseudo-science as science, and I mean, w what would be some of those tactics that they use? Yeah. Well, one of the reasons is, of course, that why they do that, the reason why they do that is, of course, because science within, especially within uh, our society, our modern society, science is considered to be an authority. Right? So, for instance, now, in, in, in the case of the pandemics, we turn to virologists and epidemiologists uh, to, to, uh, to inform us about uh, what, what is the case, uh, what is happening, and on the basis of these insights, we can then develop uh, policy uh, in order to combat uh, the pandemics. 
So we see that for, for all of these questions, like for instance climate change uh, and other important issues, we turn to, to, to science. Um, and so this is of course something that, uh, that irrational beliefs are confronted with. Yeah? So they, they, what they try to do is they, they try to piggyback on the authority of science in order to come across as more trustworthy. And they have several ways of doing that. Uh, one, of the, one of the ways is to, for instance, um, to boost their, their PhDs, for instance. So often proponents of, of pseudoscientists, they have a PhD, but often not in a relevant area. Eh? So, uh, or for instance, they will write books that contain difficult words or mathematical formula that are completely uh, nonsensical, uh, that, that, that contribute nothing to, 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 the, to the content. Um, well, they use uh, bibliography references, and sometimes they even manage to get a paper published in, uh, in a scientific journal. Uh, of course, that's often retracted afterwards, but uh, yeah, peer review system is not uh, foolproof, huh? so it's, it's a human affair, so you can expect that science, that's, yeah, sometimes things go wrong. But of course, you can imagine that they will often uh, refer to these papers uh, as saying, look, uh, we have scientific evidence for our position. Uh, there's been the case, for instance, one of the, uh, there's been a paper quite a few years ago that uh, showed that there was a link, or allegedly showed that there was a link between uh, vaccination or some kind of vaccination and autism that was published in The Lancet, that has been withdrawn, eh? but still it had a huge impact on uh, the legit so-called legitimacy of anti-vaccination uh, beliefs, eh? so the, the opposition to, to vaccines, which is quite common, uh, or has become quite common uh, recently. Mm -hmm. So, are there any topics that we can say fall completely outside the purview of science, for example, supernatural phenomena? Can science deal with these kinds of topics? Well, I think science can do that and has done that. Um, of course, we now, we now see around, uh, where, we, where we now see at, uh, well, let me start again. When we look at, at uh, science, uh, we see that scientists always resort to natural explanations, which means uh, they will never invoke a supernatural agency or process or, or, or entity. Uh, we always refer to natural explanations, so natural causes, natural entities, natural processes. There is no supernatural agency involved. But, of course, there are some philosophers who would argue that this is a constraint, a methodological constraint that has been put uh, onto science. So, as out of a methodological concern, science does not involve the supernatural, by definition, you could say. Eh? So, it only sticks to the, to the natural. So, if you take that view, of course, then, you, you, then science indeed cannot say anything about the supernatural. But there is another way of looking at it, at this naturalism, scientific naturalism, and that is namely that the fact that we no longer, that we do not invoke supernatural explanations anymore as scientists is the result of scientific inquiry. So that at one point, take for instance in the 19th century, supernatural explanations were taken very seriously as a possible explanation for what we observe. Take for instance uh, the, 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 the complexity and the diversity of life. So when we have then Charles Darwin in his origin on the origin of species that was published in uh, 1859, uh, where he constantly writes, look, my explanation, my, in my explanation in terms of evolution by natural selection, poses a better solution than the theory of special creation. So what he does there is comparing his naturalistic theory uh, to a supernatural theory that explains the diversity and complexity of life in terms of creation, uh, so agency of the supernatural. So my idea is, and, and this is something that I developed also with uh, Martha Boudry and Johan Brachman, uh, is that, well, science has become natural because supernatural explanations were not supported by good reasons. So it's actually the result of, of scientific inquiry. But that, of course, means that the fact that we, uh, that we do not include religious language anymore in, into our scientific inquiries, that this does mean something, I think, about the existence of the supernatural. 
Whereas if you take this methodological approach and saying, no, no, but we, we say by definition that science can only talk about the natural, then of course this still leaves room uh, for, for, for religious uh, beliefs. Uh, because you can then say, oh, okay, but science only talks about the natural stuff uh, by definition. And so it cannot say anything about the supernatural. So we're, we're in the clear, we could say. Uh, so we see that this position has been used, and then we can return to the demarcation project. And so this uh, has been used, this idea, uh, in, in, the, um, in the struggle with intelligent design. So there was a trial around 2004, 2005 in uh, Dover, Pennsylvania, where philosophers argued that indeed science was methodologically naturalistic in the sense that I just explained, saying, look, science can, can say nothing about the supernatural. It just assumes, it just uh, sticks to natural explanations out of a methodological uh, principle. Huh? Um, and that, of course, was used against intelligent design, which is a modern form of creationism that says that, look, there are some instances of biological design, uh, so adaptations, uh, that can only be accounted for in terms of an intelligent designer. And you see, of course, where this definition of methodological naturalism can come in handy because you can then say, oh, but wait a minute, with your intelligent design eh, explanation, you invoke a supernatural explanation. So by definition, you're not doing science anymore. You are doing religion. Eh? So it's, it's a religious debate rather than a scientific debate. But of course, this elicits the response by people from intelligent design that they have been well, ruled out from the start so that they're not even taken seriously. Huh? So maybe they have good evidence for, for a designer, but scientists are so dogmatic, they don't want to open them, them, their minds. Huh? So here you see that they, they use that kind of argument. Um, and they say, look, uh, we, we've been excluded a priori by some philosophical decision, but uh, hey, why not take a look at the evidence? And we say, yes, the, 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 the criterion of methodological naturalism is indeed vulnerable to that kind of complaint, to that kind of criticism. Whereas our view uh, explains why we should not take supernatural explanations uh, into account. Why? Because they're probably wrong. And because the history of science shows that these kind of explanations are probably not very convincing. Huh? So it's still possible that they are right, but in order to accept that, they have to come up with a load of evidence. Uh, so not just saying that there are some things that evolution cannot explain, but they really have to uh, bring in the evidence to uh, convince us. But they are allowed to do that. We do not want to exclude them if we are right, but they will have to come up with lots of evidence in order to, to convince us. Uh, so that is the, the different approach. So in some, yes, I think that uh, science can deal with the supernatural, or at least with supernatural explanations that it has dealt with supernatural explanations, but it, it turned out that, uh, well, supernatural explanations, that they do not do a proper job, uh, that they not, do not work uh, properly. Mm -hmm. Can we say that we, uh, I mean, people are prone to believing in pseudoscience, and if so, what would be the explanation behind it? Could it be, I mean, the result of evolutionary processes? I mean, would there be some sort of evolutionary psychology account of these phenomena? Mm -hmm. um, well, I do not think, well, it, it depends, of course, what you mean with being prone to believing in, in the science. Huh? I don't think that intuitively people will generate um, sort of scientific beliefs by themselves. What I do think is that um, we are vulnerable to um, scientific beliefs, the way that, uh, sorry, pseudoscientific beliefs, the same way that our body is vulnerable to certain pathogens. Uh, so uh, the way that our, that our mind works, I think, makes us indeed vulnerable for particular irrational beliefs once they have become available. And they become available through, well, to acts of communication, to transmission chains, where people tell each other things, and some of these things that they tell to one another are sticky, you could say. They, they stick, they, they are, well, um, how should I say it? They are, um, what's the right word? Sticky and contagious, yeah, that's it. 
So pseudoscientific beliefs are, are that are a type of such contagious beliefs, I think. Uh, and they tap into what we find intuitively appealing. So what I've been doing uh, also is, is try to show how you can explain particular patterns within pseudoscience by looking at uh, studies in cognitive and evolutionary psychology. So for instance, what you find is that um, creationism, for instance, steps into uh, our psychological essentialism, which is an, it's an intuition uh, that uh, by which that we intuitively think of organisms as containing an unobservable, immutable core, in essence. Uh, and this essence explains to a large extent the identity of that organism. So it determines how it will behave, how it de will develop, and so forth. Um, and we find that, and that, that, of course, that intuition uh, that we have, and that, uh, that from an evolutionary perspective enables us to make sense of the world very quickly, uh, because we can easily categorize uh, animals in our surroundings. Um, that, on the other hand, of course, it makes us, um, well, um, not very receptive to the idea of evolution. Uh, so, for instance, where one species does change from, one species does evolve into another species. Uh, whereas creationism, of course, says no, all species have been more or less the, the same since creation. Uh, so, you see how these kind of beliefs really tap into our intuitive expectations. Another example is, is disgust, for instance. Uh, so disgust is like this uh, intuitive microbiology that we have, because even before we were aware of the existence of microbes, that very small organisms that can make us uh, sick, we had an emotion called disgust that uh, intuitively tracked the presence of possible pathogens. Uh, so disgust, you know the feeling that, uh, uh, that you that you get when you are thinking about, well, disgusting things. Eh? And what type, what are things are usually disgusting? Well, the things that usually contain pathogens or indicate the presence of, of pathogens. Eh? So things like, like uh, feces or vomit or blood or people with uh, severe uh, stains on, on their skin, for instance, uh, maggots, cockroaches, things like this. Eh? So, and of course, you can understand the evolutionary rationality for why we have this uh, defense mechanism, you could say. Yeah? Uh, but on the other hand, it also makes us vulnerable to certain pseudoscientific beliefs. Uh, so I think, for instance, that this is the case with the, the opposition to um, genetically modified organisms, where the idea is that indeed organisms contain an essence and that this has been contaminated by introducing alien uh, DNA into it, or even thinking that this alien DNA constitutes some kind of essence, yeah? and so that you contaminate the essence of that, um, of that organism. For instance, when you would imagine that, it, that the scientist says, look, I have here a strawberry, but I have uh, modified it with, with uh, the DNA of a cockroach or something. Right? You understand that intuitively people will be a little bit like, Ugh. Do I want to eat that? But of course, from a scientific point of view, that does not make any sense uh, because well, red DNA is the same as human DNA or cockroach DNA or whatever. So it, the, the DNA itself, of course, is not disgusting, but we uh, associate it with something uh, disgusting. So where was I going? Well, so with, uh, with the genetically modified organism, uh, so people are disgusted because it's contaminated, and you see that, that here, that the emotions of disgust make certain kind of information or misinformation um, really interesting for our mind, the way that our mind uh, works. So what you get is that, for instance, people will say that uh, that genetically modified organisms will cause all cause will cause all sorts of uh, of diseases. Uh, you had these images of rats with, with enormous ulcers. Uh, and the implication was that they had been eat, uh, eating uh, genetically modified organisms. That was true, but that was also the case with the rats that did not eat genetically modified organisms. And the reason is that these, that these rats are used for, uh, for cancer research. And they are used for cancer research because they tend to spontaneously develop these enormous ulcers. And so it had nothing to do with genetic modification, but nevertheless, you can see yeah, that when these pictures went around the world, that people would have something like, uh, if this is only possible that this will happen, it does not even have to be true, but if this is a possibility that this will happen, you probably will be a little bit uh, more careful. Uh, and the same thing, for instance, with uh, vaccination belief. So, for instance, Helena Mito and Hugo Messier have argued that uh, this disgust uh, 
also applies to uh, vaccination because, of course, in the case of vaccination, you uh, actively insert a pathogen uh, into your body. So you see why uh, the disgust reflex might um, make people skeptical of, uh, of taking a vaccine, which is, of course, highly relevant in the, in the current uh, situation. Mm -hmm. So, while I was formulating my last question, I asked you about an evolutionary psychology account of things. And I've already had many evolutionary psychologists on the show. And I think that this discipline is very controversial among philosophers of science. I mean, it, would you say that it's really a science? Is it in any way a pseudoscience? What is your take on that? Well, for what it's worth, uh, I think that evolutionary science, uh, psychology is a, is a proper science. Eh? Um, I think that especially its uh, theoretical, its basic theoretical assumptions are as sound as, uh, <laughs> as sound a theoretical uh, underlying assumption can be. Yeah? Uh, why? Because the basic assumption is that the mind is a result of evolution by natural selection. Eh? And we only have one good explanation for why we why we have biological complexity, and that is evolution by natural selection. So why, I do not see why that the, the human mind would be excluded <laughs> from that uh, from that perspective. Uh, otherwise, what, what is what's the alternative? Um, so I think in that regard, it's definitely a science. That of course does not mean that all evolutionary psychology uh, is of the same level, but I think that problem applies to all disciplines and especially to all branches of uh, uh, psychology. Uh, so I don't think it's particular to uh, evolutionary psychology. I also think that most of the allegations, like for instance, that it is used um, in defense of the status quo, for instance, or that it involves uh, genetic determinism, things like that. These are, well, they, they, they are not proper criticisms. I don't think that they apply to evolutionary psychology. And if it does apply to certain studies in evolutionary psychology, then I think it's not proper evolutionary psychology. So then there's a problem with these specific uh, studies. Um, so, only, so in, in some, uh, very short, I think that there's nothing wrong with uh, evolutionary psychology. Moreover, I think it, it offers us a wonderful perspective on who we are. And so me foremost, as a philosopher, I'm, I'm most interested in philosophical anthropology. So thinking about who we are, yeah, what makes us human. Um, and from that starting point, I eventually ended up with science, becoming a philosopher of science, but also from this perspective. So how is it, how is it possible that we, that we can develop this wonderful, complex theories like quantum theory or evolution, evolutionary theory, things like that? It's, it's amazing. Huh? We are... We are evolved creatures, and nevertheless, we are capable of doing that. On the other hand, we also see, of course, that there are lots of irrational beliefs, conspiracy theories, and and, and again, the same mind produces these these weird these weird beliefs. So this this is what I find fascinating, and I think we can find questions to to answers like this uh, from evolutionary theory, from evolutionary uh, psychology, because I think evolutionary psychology explains. Why we have the mind we do, why we behave the mind uh, the, the way that we do. Huh? So I think evolution, an evolutionary perspective in general, can explain to a large extent uh, why we are the way we are, but also what our potentials are, what our what our capacities are like, but also what our limitations are like. Huh? So for instance, when we look at the body, I think the body, the evolution of the body is less, much less controversial. Uh, we see, for instance, that we have legs by which we can run. We can run a little bit, but we cannot really run very fast. Uh? And so from an evolutionary account, we can explain why this is the case. And I think it's the same thing with, with, with our minds. Uh? We can do things with our mind, but there are certain constraints, limitations. And then if we want to overcome them, what we also do with science, uh? but if we want to overcome them, then we have to use certain... Uh, well, then we have to take measures, uh? so to speak. We have to find ways to to overcome these uh, limitations. So I think that in that regard, for instance, evolutionary psychology is an important sort of help to understand what kind of uh, traits or what kind of characteristics that need to be addressed in order to create, for instance, a better society, because we are no angels. Huh? Um, we, we have aspects that are moral and that, that, that are good, huh? but we are animals, so we also have aspects that are less, uh, less nice. Huh? 
Uh, and so if we want to bring out the good, then we can take certain measures. Huh? So this is, and I think evolutionary psychology can help us with that, uh, with, with its insights about who we are and how we can improve ourselves, so to speak, um, and, and things like that. In your work, you're also interested in understanding how pseudo-scientific and scientific beliefs spread among people. I mean, uh, and the diffusion of those types of beliefs. And at, at least to some extent, you resort to cultural attraction theory. So what is cultural attraction theory? Well, cultural attraction theory is, well, I'm not sure whether I'm the, the right person to explain it, so I hope I do a good job. Uh, the cultural attraction theory is a naturalistic approach to culture, which means that it tries to account for cultural phenomena anchored in our understanding of the human mind, which is in turn anchored in our understanding of evolutionary biology and so forth. And so it's, it's integrated with, with the other sciences. So what is cultural attraction theory? Well, it starts from, I think, the observation that culture is not a thing. It's not something like information or something, but it is a property. Uh, so it's a property, namely, of items, representations, beliefs, uh, artifacts that are shaped and, and distributed through um, transmission chains, so uh, through the chains of social uh, transmission. Now, the thing is with, with the interesting thing about social transmission is that it's quite unstable. Uh, so think, for instance, of the uh, children's game of, of telephone, uh, where you have a line of children and you whisper something in the ear of the first child and then you hear it, uh, so they whisper in each, in each other's ear and then you listen what uh, the last child in the row uh, has made of it. And it's usually complete, something completely different. Yeah? Um, and so you see, this, this is an illustration of how communication is unstable. You can also observe it, for instance, when, uh, when you give a, a lecture as a, as a lecturer for your students. And afterwards, you would ask, now, what have you taken away from this lecture? You would get uh, as many different versions as there are students in the room, I think. So each, each of these individuals, each of these students will come up with its own reconstruction of the lecture that I have just delivered, based on well background beliefs or points of interest, things that they f they, they find relevant. Right? So you see how basically communication is a is a distortive uh, process. Now, nevertheless, when we zoom out of these processes, we see that there is cultural stability. So the pro the, the the question is then, of course, how do we explain this stability? Nevertheless, knowing that the underlying chains of transmission that they are not really reliable. So I don't think that the stability that we observe in culture comes from stable communication processes such as imitating or copying, uh, but that's re that we have to, to account for the st uh, cultural stability in another way, namely uh, by shared factors of attraction. Uh, so what we observe uh, with this cultural stability is that when we have all these chains of social transmission, that the cultural items will tend to end up around particular types of items, types of representations. So this is a particular distribution that we can then observe, and we call that, and that they converge around cultural attractors. That's a, a, an ideal type a point in the space of possible uh, representations. So when we have all these tokens uh, that seem to converge around this ideal type, this ideal type is called a cultural attractor. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then let me know if something is unclear. Uh, so, but what you see is that this cultural attractor is, is, um, is a way of describing a particular distribution, namely that you see that certain tokens tend to converge and stabilize around particular types. Uh, uh, so we get clusters of, of tokens, of items, representations around particular types. And this is the thing that we have to explain with cultural attraction theory. You see? And we do that in terms of factors of attraction. So these are the factors, the causal factors that explain why we end up with particular distributions of, of uh, items. So why some items are prevalent within cultures and others are not. That is basically the problem that needs to be solved. And so you have, on the one hand, ecological factors of attraction, so things in the, in the environment that explain why certain representations are more common than others. And then we have psychological factors uh, of attraction, which are, of course, mental factors. Uh, so the distinction is basically factors in the mind and outside the mind. And one important factor, right, is, is the is cognition, is universal human cognition. This is an important psychological factor of attraction. So on the whole, um, 
cultural attraction theory, which is also known as cultural epistemology or epistemology um, of representations. Eh? So this is a theory that that I, I forgot to mention was developed first by Dan Sperber. Eh? Um, so the the prediction that the theory makes is that on the whole, eh, when there are no other influences, that the beliefs that are more that are the most intuitively appealing that it tap into our intuitive expectations that they stand the, the biggest chance of becoming widely spread and thus to become cultural. And here, of course, here I thought it was interesting to look at uh, through the scientific belief to what extent, indeed, that this intuitive appeal uh, could account for the popularity of, uh, of pseudoscience. And indeed, as I explained, you can find quite a few examples of intuitively appealing uh, pseudoscientific uh, beliefs. Would you have something to add to, um, I mean, uh, uh, what are the specific aspects of the diffusion of pseudo-scientific beliefs that we can get a better understanding of by applying cultural attraction theory? Well, I think the most important uh, contribution comes from the fact that we recognize that uh, Representations, beliefs will tend to converge upon the most intuitive, upon intuitive uh, versions. Eh? So this is also something, for instance, that we have not only within pseudoscience, but for instance, also within the public understanding of science. So when you teach uh, students or lay people about scientific concepts, they will have a tendency of distorting that in the ver in the direction of more intuitive versions. It's very interesting. So, for instance, when you when you say something about evolutionary theory. And you say that it depends upon the blind variation, as to it's basically a blind process. Then we see, uh, not only a, a, among uh, people living today, but also historically, that this process becomes distorted in the direction of a, an intentional or a, a teleological process. Uh, so we also know from research, for instance, by uh, a psychologist Deb Kellerman, that we have an inclination to think about phenomena that occur in the world in terms of their function or their goal. So, for instance, intuitively, we explain the existence of rain because it waters the plants. And this function explains why rain exists. Eh? So this is, this is an intuitive way of thinking about the world. And so when we inform people about the scientific theory, we observe, uh, well, psychologists observe, of course, that uh, people will systematically distort the theory in particular directions, which can be explained in terms of intuitions that we have uh, to look at the world. Eh? For instance, Andrew Stuhlman has written this wonderful book about uh, called Science Blind, uh, in which he explains that these intuitions, eh, they make us blind to science, and it, it, makes us, it makes it difficult for us to understand these abstract uh, scientific concepts. Why? Because we are not properly suited, and eh? we have not evolved to deal with the scientific uh, ideas or beliefs. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult for our intuitions to really track the proper meaning of, of, these, uh, of these theories. And what we then of, uh, often observe, uh, even after years of education, that people still try to, tend to transform uh, these theories in systematic, intuit more intuitive uh, ways. And as I already explained, we also observe that with, uh, with um, pseudoscience, uh, so that within pseudoscience we often find uh, ideas that are still uh, very much intuitive. The reason why they are that way, I think, is that they are not taking part in the in the scientific dialogue, and so they have ex they have withdrawn, so to speak, or they are, have never entered uh, the scientific dialogue, which of course means that they have never been exposed to proper criticism, um, and by and and for that reason, of course, they can maintain their intuitively appealing uh, beliefs, and at the same time, of course, they have the advantage in the dissemination because intuitively appealing beliefs, well, as cultural attraction theory predicts, they, they will find an easy, well, they, they easily um, convince people that they are correct right? because people tend, they are vigilant, right? they are quite critical of the kind of information that they receive from others, right? but nevertheless, right? when something coheres with what you already intuitively expect, then right, you drop your guards, so to speak, and then you accept, uh, you're more prone to accepting uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of belief. Mm -hmm. Can we say that pseudoscience is irrational, or is it rational in certain ways, or to some extent? 
Well, the problem is, of course, that rationality is a concept that is very ambiguous. It has several meanings. Eh? Um, so we have to be careful when we say that uh, pseudoscience is irrational. Um, for instance, it does not mean that um, purveyors and adherents of pseudoscience, that they do not have reasons for why they believe the things that they believe. Eh? So they are, they are humans, and as all humans, they want to be justified in what they believe or what they do. Huh? And so they will have reasons. The, the thing is um, that the reasons are not, good, not not good in comparison to the reasons that scientists find acceptable. So you could say that uh, adherents of pseudoscience are not irrational in the sense that they are without reasons for what they believe. Because yeah, even in each community, you will have expectations about what kind of beliefs and what kind of practices are acceptable. Uh, so they will also have their local epistemologies, uh, so things that count as knowledge and proper justifications for knowledge. Uh, but they will be very different from the expectations about good reasons for, that are um, popular within, within science. Uh. So this, I think, explains why we can say from that perspective that Pseudoscience is indeed irrational because it's not supported by proper reasons, or at least reasons deemed proper by the scientific uh, community. And what's interesting is that there has been some uh, research, uh, psychological research, that shows that, um, for instance, believers in pseudoscience, or well, believe in pseudoscience and acceptance of uh, scientific theories, that this, that this indeed depends on different epistemological expectations, so different expectations about what counts as knowledge. So this I find very interesting. Huh? So it's not that they do not have reasons, but on the basis of their reasons, they, they end up with different, or you could say lower expectations about what counts as a good, uh, a good account. Yeah? So for instance, when you look at creationism, the idea that you can uh, justify your belief just by uh, pointing at your intuition is something that's unacceptable for scientists. That's only the start. When you have an intuition, then you have to research whether your intuition is true and come up with all, all sorts of justifications for why uh, your, your, your intuition was legitimate. But in other contexts, just saying, no, no, but this is the way I feel, is already acceptable as a reason for saying, okay, that's, this, is, this is okay. You see? So... Um, it's, it's a complex uh, question, but I think that we can say, uh, no, they're not irrational in the sense that they have no reason. It's not that they are sick or that they have been contaminated or that they, that they stopped reasoning or that they followed, that they relied on other cognitive mechanisms. I don't think that's the case. I think pseudoscience and science depends on the same cognitive, the same communicative processes, uh, but they end up at different places. Um, and depending on the place where they end up, of course, you will see that uh, based on this ordinary capacity of reasoning in an interactionist setting, uh, so referring to this new theory about uh, interactionist reasoning by Sperber and, and Mercier, uh, so depending on these processes, within pseudoscience, they end up with beliefs that are supported, sufficiently supported according to the members of the community, but they are not sufficiently supported by the standards, basing on the standards that we had have with uh, with scientific uh, knowledge. Well, I have just one last question. Uh, we've already talked about cultural attraction theory, and I think you also apply it to understanding the concept of the self. And you talk about in your work uh, about selves as cultural attractors. Could you explain that? Well, but that's of course. Uh, somewhat of a different topic and I must say I have not fully uh, developed it yet. It's also more of an intuition so I still have to justify it uh, <laughs> to, le to, to a certain extent. Uh, but yes, what I'm interested in um, is, is the place of the individual. Uh, so I've, I've been mostly working on science but I've, I've also an interest in morality and I'm particularly interested in the role of reasons, both in science and in morality. So I think that this notion of local epistemology also applies to morality, where we can talk about local moralities 
which are also the result of the exchange of reasons. Huh? Um, and so when we see development in morality, this means that we have altering clusters of reasons. So I think you can also apply this notion of cultural attraction theory or, or thinking in uh, cultural evolutionary terms about rationality. Why? Because they are you, you can think about rationality, I think, as clusters of types of reasons. And when, of course, morality or science changes, then we have altering distributions or populations of reasons that determine what kind of behavior or what kind of beliefs are justified. Now, this is something that I've only been recently uh, developing. And so I want to also want to understand the role of the individual within these clusters of reasons and how it can conform to uh, this type of re these popular types of reasons, but also manipulate it. So I, I'm thinking more and more about the self as this, this has already, this is not new, of course, I'm thinking about the self as these clusters of, of, of reasons uh, that we attribute to ourselves, motives and things like that. Uh, but we do that in response, in strategic response to the, um, the, um, the, the context posed by this, these clusters of reasons. So reasons that, that uh, determine what kind of behavior and what kind of beliefs an individual is allowed to have, you could say. But of course, by providing you reasons, and you can, if, if they are convincing, you can also manipulate the, 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 the space of reasons, you could say. Huh? Um, and yeah, you see, it, I have not really <laughs> thought this through, uh, but w the self, I think, is, is a way of uh, well conforming on the on the one hand uh, to this to this uh, local morality, and on the other hand also trying to manipulate it by just picking the right reasons that it can account for the kind of behavior that you are conducting or the kind of beliefs that you that you have. But it's still very preliminary. So if anyone has uh, good ideas about this, I'm uh, <laughs> more willing. I'm very willing to to hear them. Good. Okay, so before we go, where can people find your work on the internet? Uh, well, I don't have a, 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 a web page myself yet. Um, this is something that uh, that I uh, that I hope to do soon. Um, but I have, of course, my uh, Google Scholar page. Um, I also have a page on ResearchGate, where you can find quite a few uh, publications. And if you really want to read something that you cannot find on the internet, always feel free to send me an email. I'll, I'll respond as soon as, uh, as possible. Okay, great. So I will leave links to all of that in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Blanke, again, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It was really fun to talk to you. Thank you, Ricardo. It was fun. Bye-bye. Hello everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with top academics and scholars from a variety of fields. So to keep this channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you prefer PayPal, I also have links to that in the description box of the video. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please leave a like, share it and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett Perga Larsen. Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Kintis, Ruth Gervoz, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zoop, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Yevan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, 
Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassi Ladeza Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, and Yannick Punter. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardis France, and Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rujewski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.